Here we go. We are we're gonna do another episode of this week in photo. This is gonna be episode number three hundred and twenty three. Do you believe that? Three twenty three. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Derek, you've you've how long have you been doing the digital the, the digital story? I just did a three ninety. Number three ninety. Oh, so you're like, yeah, whatever. Three twenty three, you puppy. <laughs> <laughs> No, but you know, we're starting to see now the the guys that you know had stayed with it from when they started, you know, and the ones that have fallen off, right? Yep. So yeah, yep. now it's, it's like you know, Martin. Martin's hung in there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so there's a there's a number of of you know where they're up at over over three hundred. Yeah, it's weird. I'm like, when did we hit that point of inflection that I became a veteran podcaster? I don't know. <laughs> it's weird. I say I say it's at three hundred. Three hundred is that? Three hundred. Like baseball. Get it's like baseball rank? wins. You know, like it. if you're a All pitcher. Right. Yeah. Well, I'll be a I'll be a one star general. You can be a three star. How about that? All right. <laughs> All right, guys. Let's get this show on the road. Episode three hundred and twenty three of this week in photo. I'm gonna kick it off now. Okay, welcome back to TWIP. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Joining me today to, to discuss some of the cool topics this week are, returning to the show, Mr. Derek Story and Joseph Linaski. Hey, guys, how you doing? Hello. Pretty, pretty Hello. good. How are you? Hello. I'm doing great. Joseph, what have, what have you been up to? What's what's going on in the, up in your neck of the woods? Well, now that the fires stopped trying to burn down all of southern Oregon, I can breathe again. So Messing up your nice. photos. How dare it? I know. <laughs> no, it's been, it's been bad. It's been bad, but uh, we got some clear air. We got a bit of a break, so that's been quite nice. Working away, working the local small businesses, doing some, uh, doing the good work there. That's cool. Spending the summer with the kids as much as humanly possible, and working on the next art project as you do. Love it. Speaking of art projects, what's that grid behind you? It looks very Instagrammy. It's 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 very Instagrammy. This is, in fact, the next art project. Um, so you know, I've been a couple of gallery shows at one of the local art gallery slash wine bars here, which mm -hmm. now I see you've got a glass of wine. I really wish that I had mine. <laughs> um, this is the next one. So this is hanging up this Friday, and I've, I'm in the process of building a 7 by 4 foot wooden frame with a string of a grid of wires, a little 6 inch interval, so there's going to be 6 inch squares, and inside of each square is going to be hanging one of these. So this is mm. printed on canvas. This is a 5 by, well there's 200 Instagram prints behind me here. I'm using 112 of them, I think, in the final piece, and tearing them off so they'll have nice little torn edges, and then clipped into the into the frame. In between and these the are all your shots, right? Yeah, these are all pictures that I've Instagram over the years uh, from travels all over the world and, and all that good fun stuff. Very cool. Very yeah. cool. Hey, by the way, um, if you haven't noticed the news, speaking of Instagram, um, this week in photo, ASMP and a bunch of other photography-related entities with acronyms for names. <laughs> um, uh, we sort of had a discussion, and we are not fans of the terms of service of Instagram. So we're going to put a post, a link to basically what this is all about and and how we feel about the terms of service that Instagram is imposing on photographers. I'll put that in the show notes, but we don't need to belabor it here. And I don't want to rain on your cool art project. <laughs> <laughs> it's art, man. So just Start. check it out. It's, it's all good. It's all for the goodness of photography and photographers. So, I get all right, cool. Well, welcome back, Joseph. Derek Thanks, Story. What's yes. going on with you, the digital story man? Yeah, I've been I've been on the go. Uh, I just spent the weekend out at Sonoma Coast doing a workshop out there, and nice. uh, I love that workshop. It's one of my favorites. Uh, the, actually, my two favorites are the one that we just had out at Sonoma Coast, and then Fall Color coming up in October. Uh, so yeah, I was doing that, and um, uh, I was down at Linda recording some Aperture titles, cool. and uh, that was those are going to be out. Ooh man, I'm hoping next week. Sweet. Hoping, hoping not on uh, not on the ninth though. <laughs> Wait, what happens on the ninth? Oh, ninth and tenth. Oh, nothing. Nothing. It'll be quiet. Quiet day on the tenth. <laughs> <laughs> quiet day on the tenth. I love it. I love it. Can hold uh, what are your new Aperture titles? Um, you're going to appreciate. Actually, we have someone on the show that will appreciate this. So one is Portrait Retouching. Nice. Portrait Retouching nice. was just the Aperture tools, and it's amazing what you can do. And then the other one is uh, uh, Product Photography, 
uh, improving your product photography just with Aperture tools. So nice. I show how to change colors, how to manipulate backdrops, how to clean up uh, skin, how to lighten the bags under the eyes, you know, all that, all that stuff, just letting Aperture do the heavy lifting. That's cool. And you're not round tripping into Photoshop at all for any of that? No, 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 no. That's no, cool. No, no, no. I want to I see those. I, we, see I, we, I do uh, one segment where I do a round tripping to Nick uh, mm -hmm. on silver effects for black cool. and white. You but, see, uh, if, you no, can't, you, if you can't get Aperture Expert to help you promote those or something. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk. <laughs> we're gonna talk. Uh, so, well, welcome back. We, we got ongoing conversations. Uh, you know, at some point, we will we will take over the world, but exactly. sure, right cool. now we're just in the planning phases of it. You know, everything deserves a little planning. <laughs> good. Well, welcome back to both of you guys. It's good to, good to have you guys back on. Um, just a quick news story update. Way back in a couple of episodes, I think it was maybe 10 episodes ago or so, um, we did a story of a New Mexico wedding photographer who was being sued by a gay couple for refusing to take pictures of their ceremony. Well, we wanted to report on that, and the verdict is in, and the photographer lost. So we would love it to hear what you guys think. We'll link over to that story in the notes for this episode, but we'd love to hear what you think about that, listeners, in the comments on blog posts for this show. So you've been updated. All right, guys, let's jump into let's jump into the news. Story number one that we're going to talk about is it involves Facebook and Shutterstock. They've partnered to offer new advertising opportunities on Facebook. So essentially, um, Shutterstock's library of over 25 million stock images, and by the way, Shutterstock is a one of our advertisers. They're not a, they're not uh, promoting this episode, but they are an advertiser of Twip. Um, but they've got a library of over 25 million stock images, and they're making those available to Facebook advertisers. So previously, if you were going to advertise on Facebook, you had to go in and upload your own imagery and all that. Now you can choose from the Shutterstock library. So I wanna, wanted to put that to, to you guys just from the, the standpoint of, you know, if you rewind back, we know stock photography as we know it changed, I don't know, what, 10 years, 15 years ago, Derek, you know, with the, with the advent of microstock? And yeah, microstock definitely yeah. changed a lot of things. I mean, it like kind of threw a bomb in a lot of people's livelihoods. And <laughs> <laughs> to be, to be, and you know, to put it lightly, right? Cre and did create some livelihoods for others. So right, know. exactly. Yeah. So it laid waste, and then some some trees yeah. sprouted yeah. in the wasteland. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Your very but, your metaphors are very natural today. Yes. It is. I'm, I'm very yeah, yeah, organic yeah. metaphors is what you're working. I'm going to try to continue that trend. Yeah, okay, let's see how long it goes. So, so, so to both of you guys, Derek, you first. So, what does this mean? So now that these these agencies, these stock agencies, are doing these back end sort of B two B pipeline deals to provide imagery that way instead of you know like you going to Shutterstock buying an image and then uploading to Facebook. What does it mean for photographers? Anything at all, or is this a good thing? Is this more of a more of a an opportunity for the images to get used, or is this more dilution of of photography? It's probably. I mean, it makes sense to me. It, it's this is something seems like a good move uh, for for both parties, uh, and it, for those that have images in Shutterstock, it's probably a, a good move too. You know, it introduces mm -hmm. uh, a nice big audience. I don't see it, and I could be wrong, and maybe you and Joseph will have a, a different viewpoint on this. I don't see it really hurting anyone. Uh, you know, right now. I mean, if there was some sort of like our next story where. One entity is replaced by another entity. You know that, that you know that that's kind of one thing. But but there wasn't any entity before really providing images to these advertisers. They were just kind of scrambling around. And who knows? Maybe the ads will look better too. I mean, you know that <laughs> if that's if that's a byproduct of this, I you know I would be okay with that. So yeah. I, I don't I, I can't see right now off the top of my head any big any big damage uh, to anyone. It just seems like a good B two B move to me. So all positive from your, from your well, yeah. As far as we can see, anyway. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Joseph? Where do you fall on this? Is it a good thing for for shooters? I I think it's for the most part indifferent. I don't think too many photographers are going to lose money by not being able to license photos to uh, companies who are going to advertise on Facebook. You know the the size the size of the image is so small that in the ads on there that I don't think too many companies were going out of the way to license expensive photography for use in their ads. Mm -hmm. um, I just I don't really see it being an issue. I don't see any photographers losing money out of it. And as Derek said, maybe the end result is we'll get some better looking ads in there. And they'll stop trying to 
you know, use excuses to steal ads from other people. You know, that the whole kerfuffle about seeing your own photo showing up in ads targeted to you. Wait, what? Right. That somehow didn't quite make sense, but right. yeah, if you know if they're decent images, sure, why not? Because I don't I don't think anybody's gonna lose any money on it. Now are are the either of you guys using Facebook as an advertising platform to get the word out about the digital story or you know your aperture site? I've tried it several times and just never saw the ROI on it. Hmm. So no traction at all? Just like minimal, not enough to justify the cost. Interesting, huh? What about yeah, it you, is because you it's so targeted. You would think that it would, but yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Because you can niche down into like people that are left-handed that live in Milwaukee right. on the north side of the street and drive a blue car. Right, right? and that's awesome when you can do that level of of uh, of analysis or that level of drill down. It's great, but yeah, on I've run tests probably three or four times over as many years. And I've spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars, maybe even thousands, on advertising through Facebook and just never saw the results, never saw the ROI. Interesting. Derek, what about you? Have you, have you tried it? So uh, I have a, a fan page for Digital Story, for the Digital Story, and it's a nice little watering hole. Uh, you, you know, uh, I like it because I can bring stories in from different spots. And uh, I don't do advertising per se, but what I do do is I boost posts. And, you know, so where you can take an individual post and boost it. Mm -hmm. And the, the main reason why I do that is because, you know, Facebook doesn't serve a post like when I do a podcast post. They don't serve it to everyone in my audience. Only a fraction of my audience see it. So if you boost it, and in my case, it usually costs me like 20 bucks to do that, then, then it, it not only gets to everyone in my audience, but it'll also get to a lot of their friends also. See, that's and, key right there. That's a key point that I think a lot a of people point. don't understand with, with, mm -hmm. with Facebook. Like when you post something up there, n not necessarily everybody that is your friend or following you is going to see no. that, right? No, and are, we know, know they're not. Do you have any math or any logic behind what the rhyme or reason behind who gets to see what or how does that work? Um, I, I've heard different theories, and I don't, I don't know the I don't know what uh, you know what the formula is for it. Yeah. Uh, it, actually, that would be a good interview, Frederick. You know, that would be good to have someone on the show that really understood that. Like Mark Zuckerberg I, or somebody. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Start at the hey, top. You don't know until you ask. Who you knows? don't you know until yes. you ask. You know, but um, I, I think that would be interesting. But you're right. I think the first thing that people have to know is not everyone has seen. It. In fact, only a fraction of your audience is uh, you know seeing any given post. And then if you boost it though, then that you know then that changes. So that is a you know that's that's a business uh, plan for Facebook, right? That is. I mean, but that seems. I don't know. I mean, Joseph, what do you did you know about that? Like sure. limited access? Does that yeah. not seem I mean, it's their business. They can do whatever the heck they want to do with sure. it, but sure. does that not seem shifty like well, <laughs> you have all these people that have that have followed you because they say they want to hear what you have to say, but you know what? If you want if you actually want to meet them, then you got to pay up a little. Come sure. on. <laughs> yeah, when you put it that way. Um, but you know, like Derek, I've got a fan page that, or whatever it's called that's for my but it's kind of everything. The photo Joseph stuff and the Aperture Extra stuff all goes there. And so that has its group of followers. And whenever I post something on there, as the moderator, you'll see uh, at the bottom of every post how many people have seen this. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting to go through them and see some of them are double what other ones are. And I don't know if there's if it's because of the popularity of it, but how does it... I don't think it could be because maybe it has to do with who, how many people click on it. And if more people are clicking, they end up getting thrown on other people's pages. I don't really know. I don't know how that number... You know, how that come how they come up with that um, how many people it actually gets thrown at but I've never tried boosting it I've never tried paying for it I would only do that if I was selling something on it so yeah. if I was advertising a sale for example then I would I would consider doing that and if Derek if you say that it's it gets you more eyeballs on it for sure then it's it worth certainly it's worth a fifteen or twenty dollar investment and that's nothing yeah you know like for on the pod I do it on the podcast because I want everyone in my audience to at least know what this week's podcast is right whether they decide to listen to it or not that's up to them and a lot of them are getting it automatically in iTunes and so forth but mm -hmm. I, I like getting it in front of them and uh, when I boost it uh, the numbers are you know ten times what they would be if I didn't boost it. Wow, and it, okay. And it cost me uh, 15 or $20. That's crazy. So, wow. And, you know, they just bill it to my PayPal. So 
So uh, you know, to your point, Frederick, I'm you know I'm spending you know right around eighty bucks a month you know f for my Facebook uh, advertising, but that's the only kind that I do. I just take specific things and I boost it. And it's funny, you know, the other thing about Facebook advertising is a marketplace. I wish I I did understand better, because you know some days. Uh, you you can boost for ten dollars and you'll get just as many numbers. Other days it'll cost you twenty. And as you know, when you when you buy advertising, you know you have to check in and set the price uh, every day because it changes mm -hmm. constantly. You know, some days you know it's uh, it's going to be you know twenty cents an impression, and other days it's going to be seventy five cents is what they recommend. It's probably you know? it's probably and, and, you know it's just like they're they're adjusting. It's probably Facebook adjusting as Revenue targets track towards the end of the quarter. <laughs> I'm just guessing. <laughs> oh crap! No, We're I mean, not going to meet know, our targets. We need to increase that by a buck. And we'll hit them. <laughs> there's, I mean, there's, I, I, this is crazy stuff going on with all that. But uh, you know, as Joseph was saying earlier, that if you buy flat out advertising, let's say you know you're just doing, you know, where you target the demographic and you do all that sort of stuff, that can get pricey really fast. I mean, you can yeah. you can spend uh, easily. Easily, uh, four or five hundred dollars a month, and you know, without even blinking an eye. No, so. I mean, not to beat this too, too, too hard, but I, I'm just curious about this, Derek. In your, in your, your experience, have you done any conversion tests? You, you know, for that twenty, fifteen to twenty bucks, you can say that that directly correlates to X many people a, like signing up for your workshops or, you know, doing something <laughs> else that's tied to revenue. Yeah, yeah, I have, and you know, the other thing that I've noticed that goes up. Uh, when I do that is, you know, there's another uh, factor of people talking about it, you know, how, how many people are talking about your fan page right now or, mm. or items on, that, that number usually goes up about 35%. Uh, mm. You know when I when I'm boosting a popular when I'm boosting a popular post, mm -hmm. and then um, when people sign up for a, a workshop or any sort of activity that I do, I ask them how you know how they heard about it. Still, the number one way is referral from a friend. I mean, you know that you know just it, whether it's restaurants or or cameras or whatever. I mean that's still the most powerful thing. But um, the you know Facebook is in there. Facebook you can't beat word uh, of mouth, man. Really? Yeah, no, word of mouth is is king. Word Joseph, you're you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna push and promote or boost your next post, aren't you? Well, the next post where I'm actually selling something. I'm not gonna yeah. do it just for a, a random. Because remember, I don't have any advertisers to appease, so yeah, I don't need to yeah. prove numbers through adver for advertisers. Um, if I'm not selling something, you know, promoting a product for sale or a discount that I'm offering, then there's no point in paying to promote it. Um, yeah. It just doesn't really make sense, and it's funny. I'm looking at it, and when you do to promote, you know, it suggests whatever fifteen dollars or something to promote. Mm -hmm. It tells you how many it's going to hit. So I started playing with the numbers, and if I boost the budget all the way to two thousand five hundred dollars, it says <laughs> that I will reach an estimated my entire potential audience. Oh, so, yeah. So twenty five hundred bucks, I can reach uh, a lot of people. So, and your potential audience is not only the people that like you, but it's it's everyone that likes that they're connected to too. Right, that, and it's five hundred twenty thousand people that they've that it oh, has added up. So okay, okay. for twenty five hundred bucks, I can reach half a million people. You know, and if awesome. I'm selling something for twenty bucks, that could be very worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you get like a one point five or two percent conversion on that, you could, that's not sure. bad, right? So maybe I'll try that next time. So I'll go, you know, I think I'll go for the full 2500 but I'll give it more than 15 bucks. I think what's interesting uh, you know, about this, to me anyway, is that the, how the playing field has changed in that I, I'm not sure 10 years ago that I would be able to be just this guy you know, hanging out, you know, kind of doing what I want to do for a living. You know? mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's the case. And, and, and you know, the fact that um, you know, things like you know, where I can get advertising this way, where there are social networks that I can plug into. That Squarespace offers me a, a, a shopping cart for you know peanuts. You know, yeah. It, it, yeah. I mean, this is crazy stuff. I mean, so I mean, literally, a, a, a man or a woman with an idea and an internet connection right now can basically start a business. And yeah, that, that part, person. That part I really like. You can start a business. You can um, start a television channel. You can start a radio show. Yeah. You know, you can do whatever the heck you want. Or you can, hey, bring it in full circle. 
start a photography business. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Photography, that's totally dead. Who yeah, does I know. This, is this week in media, or the, no, this week in marketing is what we were doing. <laughs> well, and uh, totally close to the loop, just don't start a stock photo business. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's a little late for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah so it's already been done. So yeah, you know, think, that, that's think of something else. So Derek, yeah. Derek, or both of you guys, we'll start with you, Derek. What, what would your advice be to... You know the photographer that's out there that say is a wedding photographer mm-hmm. um, that's starting out. They got their site up there. They got their Facebook page. They've customized everything, and they're like, you know, I want to get some traffic coming in here so I can get more bookings. Would would this kind of thing, like advertising on Facebook using Shutterstock's library, would that be something that they should experiment with, or is it maybe wait until they get a little larger? Well, no, I think they need to look at online uh, possibilities right away. And the first thing I would think about, because I did do weddings for a while, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, actually they helped me get my business going because it was cash flow. Yeah. And uh, the thing that I did was I targeted what areas I wanted to work, you know. And it, it's, so in my case is Sonoma County, Napa County, San Francisco, Marin County. That's where I wanted to shoot weddings because the, the clients there, you know, would, would pay you know, a decent amount for a photographer. Right, right. So, uh, so I, in those, when I first started, I, I wish I would have had this demographic, demographic uh, sort of targeting. I had to do things like, you know, yellow book ads and, you know, all that kind of stuff, newspapers and all that. Wow. But, yeah, I mean, really, I mean, it was rough uh, right. because you got no feedback, really. I mean, you know, but now um, I would definitely do some of this targeted advertising in the areas, you know, so the ads or, or whatever you're serving up goes to people where you want to do your work, you mm-hmm. know, whatever that work has been. And I, I say yes. I say do it. Joseph, what about you? What would your advice be to the, the new photographer jumping into this, trying to get the word out about themselves? Facebook? Yeah, same, same thing. Well, sure, it, because you can target it so so directly and if you I think if you live in a small town or you're surrounded by smaller towns where it's a little bit easier to stand out you know if your target market is the greater Los Angeles area that's a little bit harder to get into but if you're going for smaller counties or smaller towns or like where I am here in Ashland it's a tiny little town it's a little bit easier to get seen that way so yeah I think it's a perfectly valid way to go why not yeah and and it's, it's, absolutely. It is even if you're try. even if you're in Los Angeles you know it's it's a large area but you could say you know, I only want to service clients that live in El Segundo, Mar- you know, Marina del Rey, right. and whatever. You know, and yeah, just I would get say the most important area. thing is to make sure that you can track it, so you know whether it's working or not. Whether that means, you know, if if I'm doing a a discount code, right, I might put a different discount code on Facebook versus Twitter. Same discount, you know, same twenty percent off or whatever. But then I can track and see which one had more traction. Yeah. Or if you're going to post an ad that says "Call me." Go on Google Plus and get a dozen different or whatever Google um, calls. What's it called? The Google Google number. Google. What's it called? Where you get phone numbers on Google? Oh, Google Voice. Yeah. Google Voice. That's the one. Mm-hmm. And get a bunch of different phone numbers and post those different phone numbers to different ad ads and just see which numbers are getting the most calls. And there's lots of different ways to do that kind of tracking. Yeah. Well, you mentioned yeah, Google. So what about what about Google? You know, we've been talking about Facebook and advertising on there. You can do the same kind of niche down demographic targeting on Google. So if, if a photographer is like, you know what, I only got a hundred bucks this week, you know, to get to, to spend on this, where should that hundred bucks go? Should they put it in Google's pocket or should they put it in Facebook's pocket? Well, I think that's a good question. I mean, I think with Google you don't even have to, to spend the money. If you if you create content that uh, you know that's targeted, you know, where you, you put the good keywords in, you do all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the nice thing about, and put it in Google+, Plus. I mean, it shows up on a Google search like three minutes later. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I, well, at least it does for me anyway. I mean, I, I imagine there's some variance there, but uh, I always put stuff in Google+, Plus because, uh, you know, one of the ways that people are looking for you is through Google search. Yeah. And, you know, don't write off Bing either. I mean, Bing is, is up and coming and, you know, doing uh, a better job all the time. Uh, and you they know, power the, Yahoo search, so Bing slash Yahoo, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, these these things can be very helpful. But I think in the, in that case, you don't even have to spend advertising dollars. You just have to create content, uh, you know, so that people in the areas will find you. You yeah. know. And, yeah. Joseph, you what, know, what do you say about that? Google? You, well, I mean, a hundred bucks doesn't go far on Google. It really doesn't. Yeah. Uh, I I remember one time when I was doing an ad 
test and I forgot to turn it off and then I got an eight hundred dollar bill from Google. Oh, crap. Did you pay it? <laughs> well, obviously, but you know. If you don't pay it, do they shut off your Gmail account? They, they shut off your Google, right? You go to search and it says, "Sorry, you you're just no fall right out of that search engine." Then. Right. <laughs> I was on the first page. What happened? You forgot to pay your water bill. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's and and again with that, like with the Facebook, I didn't see a huge result out of it. You know, obviously my business is different than other people's, so mm-hmm. um, it all depends on what you're doing, and it's worth trying anything. But just be prepared to spend some money and not see investments be- or not see a return on it before you figure out what is going to work for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, if, else. Freddie, I just want to add on. You know, mm-hmm. so the idea for for me on all this stuff is I want to establish a beachhead where wherever it is I want to work, right? Mm-hmm. Because as we were saying earlier, the the real driver is going to be word of mouth referrals. But you got to get it going. You got to get it. Like for instance, when I knew I wanted to do weddings in Marin County, I had to get clients there in Marin County, and I had to do a good job on the wedding, and I had to make them happy so that they would tell their other friends in Marin County about me as a wedding photographer. And advertising is what got me in, and then doing a good job and encouraging people. And I think a lot of um, photographers could do more in this area. Where you encourage your happy clients to tell other people, you know, yeah. tell them, say, you know, well, make sure you, you know, you spread the word about me, and you know, let me know if, if, uh, you know, somebody uh, is interested and all that sort of stuff, yeah. and because there's that's that's where you get the really, I think, the solid clients. Yeah, and it's like uh, uh, Nate Greyhack. He's a he's a friend of mine. He runs a company called Sticky Albums, where they do. Um, uh, essentially, you create a, a, an album that's going to be displayed on a mobile device, and then he makes it really easy for you or for the client to share that with their friends on oh, yeah. you know, Facebook. Oh, yeah, that's nice. And then those people can share it, and it just goes viral that way. But it's, yeah. he's leveraging that word of mouth thing, and yeah. you know he seems to be doing okay with it. So, yeah, uh, I mean that's that that you know nothing uh, in my opinion is more powerful than you know getting your friend to recommend a service you know to to one of to another friend i mean yeah. that that's gold well close the loop close the loop for us joseph and then you, then you Derek. um we're talking about we talked about facebook we talked about um google what about twitter i mean twitter's doing advertising yeah. now too and yeah. sponsored tweets and all kinds of stuff yeah. do do you guys ever consider joseph do you ever consider using twitter as an advertising yep. mechanism tried it too Tried it like, yeah, I tried that crap. Didn't work. I've spent thousands on advertising, and the end result it comes down to what Derek said. It's word of mouth. That's where my best customers come from are because of other customers, very happy people who tell their friends, and it just spreads. And that's it. That's what works. That's but that's me. So that's advertising, my advertising will get your foot in the door. Um, and then that that allows you to impress them so that they can tell their friends and generate business. <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, I think there is there is something to that, right? Mm-hmm. Now, uh, one of my uh, clients that I work with, Low Pro, they they're doing sponsored tweets right now. Uh, they have a, a budget for it, and um, you know, I haven't seen the actual you know return on investment with it, but they seem happy. They seem happy with the traction that they're getting hmm. on them. So. Um, and they're you know, but again, uh, not cheap. I think uh, they're spending like fifteen hundred uh, a month on that, which is like, not huge for a company either. But yeah, uh, do you, you know, know what that equates to? How many tweets not, does that not, equate to? Uh, a lot. Okay, so it's not <laughs> just it's not just one guy going out and and okay, I sent a tweet, kept me a check. Well, you know, and the thing about sponsored tweets, have you guys noticed this? If you look at your own newsfeed on Twitter that you'll see a sponsored tweet more than once too like you know you'll see it one day and then like three or four days later you know that tweet might roll through there again you know so it's it's even it's there's even some repetition to it uh, yeah. so you know it's not just a, a one and gone but uh, I haven't seen uh, the return numbers on it yeah. um, you know and also and you know that I mean this is right up your alley you know are you doing brand building you know, or are you trying to get a specific return on investment for a product? You know, and that you know, there's those are are different things yeah. there. Yeah, if you're trying to, if you have a brand awareness problem and you're trying to get the word out so people know who you are, that's yeah. different than them knowing who you are, trusting you, and breaking out the credit card or the PayPal, you know, to give you some money. Right? Exactly. Exactly. Oh, cool. All right. Well, I think that horse is uh, is a bloody pulp. <laughs> 
now. We'll leave him alone. <laughs> Let's move on to the next story. And that's it Roy was Rogers. a better conversation than that. <laughs> <laughs> so should we have beaten the story? The story is done and toasted a fork in its... Is in it to flip it off we've, we've made uh, we've made dog food out of that. So, um. Oh, oh, stop. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> no more metaphors. No more metaphors. You're on, you're on a you're on a metaphor diet right now. I, I rode that metaphor horse yeah. to death, is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm on a metaphor diet now. Okay, so Reuters, the second story is Reuters cut its freelance sports photographers in the United States. So let me read this to you. So Reuters News Agency has announced a partnership with USA Today, which negates its need for freelance sports photographers in the U.S. Sports images for Reuters will now be provided by USA Today's photographers. The reportedly 30 to 50 photographers directly affected by this decision will receive non or new non-sports beats, according to sources, but can still, as of today, shoot sports for Reuters as long as they are outside of the U.S. So, Joseph, you first. What's, what does the, the future hold for people that want to go into photojournalism as a profession? That's quite a jump from that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm trying at... not to use metaphors, and that's what happens when I don't use metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so, so like what do you think about, about this story that, first? Well, if you go back to the like the Chicago Sometimes thing, right? Yes, I mean, that's, yes. That was obviously it sucked for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just the changing world that, that we're in. And if, if you want to go into business as a photographer, as a photojournalist, you are going to have a harder and harder time being a photographer that is just a photojournalist. Mm -hmm. And as we've talked about many times... I think that's times, a key phrase, Joseph. I think that's a key phrase, yeah. too. Yeah. As we've talked about many times in the show, you yeah. gotta you got to expand your, your horizons. you got to do more than one thing. And while some may see that as a, a detriment, oh, I wish, you know, all I want, I just want to do this one thing. I want to be a wedding photographer. I want to be a photojournalist. Uh, frankly, I think you can be, you become a better photographer for doing more different things. If you are a wedding photographer and a photojournalist and a sports photographer and a product photographer, when you go on that wedding job, you take all of that experience with you. When you go to shoot that product or that sports game, you take all that experience with you. And I think it makes you a better photographer, assuming that you're willing to put the work into it. It's not going to be easy, and maybe it's easier to just collect a steady paycheck and shoot pictures for whatever paper or, or agency, but this is what separates the, the cream from the whatever's not the cream. <laughs> <laughs> you're on a metaphor diet now. How about that? <laughs> All right, so, so that said, you know, devil's advocate here, a lot of people will say jack of all trades, master of none. Sure. Right. So focus on one thing and be known for that one thing. If you're going to be a wedding photographer, be the best wedding photographer on the planet. And when someone says wedding photography, your name should pop into their head. So that flies in the face of diversification. What do you say to that? Right. It, and it is very valid. And I know for myself, if I had focused for the last 10 years on just being a X type of photographer, then I would probably be financially more successful in that realm. But I sure as heck wouldn't be happier. Mm -hmm. I enjoy that I'm doing different things. I enjoy my life in the way that it is, and I enjoy the work that I do, and I enjoy that a client will call me today for one thing, and another client will call me tomorrow for something completely different. Yeah. And that I love that. That makes me happy. It's and fun. Allows me, yeah. yeah, it's fun. It allows me to work the way I work and do what I want to do and turn down jobs I don't want to do as opposed to just being the wedding guy, which nothing wrong with that. If that's what makes you happy, then awesome. But for me, I'm... I'd rather make less money and have more fun. Yeah, uh, Derek, what, what about you? I mean, is that is that the split right there? Make less money, have more fun, specialize and focus, and make a lot more money. Is that is that fair? Well, I think that's fair. Uh, I I think I think the key factor is, and I think both of you have touched on it, is though uh, do what you love, do what you love. So in in Joseph's case, he loves being diverse. You know, and he's he's good at it. He does a lot of interesting things. He comes up yeah. with a lot of interesting stuff. So uh, someone else, uh, they say they may say, you know, I only love to shoot baseball. And that is my thing, and that is my passion. And in both cases, then I would say, then do that exactly. You know, I'm not going to tell that that baseball photographer that he should diversify, and I'm not going to tell Joseph that, hey, Joseph, you really need to focus, dude. You know, I mean, uh, you know, I, so I think doing what you love is the right path. And if you, the thing about it is, 
and you know I I think I'm I'm proof of this. If you do it long enough, you will be successful. If you work hard, if you have any talent at all, you don't have to be the most talented person. But if you do it long enough and, and, and you're disciplined about it, you know you will have some success. Yeah. And then one other thing I want to say: mm -hmm. photojournalists have never been financially successful. <laughs> it's never been <laughs> yeah, a good job. Let's be clear about that. <laughs> this, I mean, I, yeah, let's just be clear because we're acting. You know, I, I, when I when I worked uh, for newspaper, uh, you know, we were paid by the column inch. I mean, we weren't even paid by. There's no salary or none of that sort of stuff. You know, we were paid by the column inch, and, and it wasn't a lot, you know, and, and that's just the way it was. Yeah. So it, it's never been a great financial job, and I think people who like photojournalism, you know, have to love it uh, to do it as a living. And if you do, you know, you'll find a way. You'll find a way. I mean, you're probably not going to be working for uh, a newspaper. They're probably not going to be a staff job. You're going to have to be an entrepreneur and a photojournalist. Yeah. Well, okay. So here, here's another question on that. So Joseph, you, you're, you're preaching the diversification sermon there, right? So, with that, you, like, you're, you can say that because you are highly skilled at shooting all kinds of stuff. You know, from rock stars to travel photography to portraits to all this stuff, product photography. You could, you could, you're in any one of those disciplines, you are as good as pros in those. So you can make that statement, or not pros, but people that choose to do that as their sole genre of photography. So you can make that statement easily. What about the person that is not at your level of competency in photography yet? They're still, still trying to figure out their their look and feel and what they like to do. Should they diversify and spread their bets around and say, okay, I'm going to learn sports, I'm going to learn rock stars and all this stuff? Or do they focus on one thing and learn that, like from a learning perspective, not just a revenue generation perspective? Well, from purely learning, then I think you're better off doing a lot of different things. You know, maybe not pick. You know, maybe you're not going to shoot one thing uh, in, a, in a month of 30 days. Not shoot a different thing every 30 days because that might be a little bit too diversified. But pick a handful of topics that are somehow related but still different enough where you have a different experience and focus on those. That's what I would advise, just so that you do get good experience and repeated experience, but also diversified experience. Yeah. And what did you do when you were starting? Did you did you pick one horse, or did you were you all over the place? I mean, which starting do you mean? I I had picked up my first camera when I was five years old, so right. I've you know literally been shooting everything and everywhere. So it's kind of that's kind of hard to say for me. But, but when you okay, let's let's draw a line when you first started charging for photography and you started calling yourself a professional photographer. Well, let's say let's go to 2009 when I left Apple and started and went freelance uh, full time. Mm -hmm. At that point, I mean, at that point, I was I came out of the gate shooting for Seal, so I had uh, and for Apple, so I had a couple of big clients right away, yep. and as those kind of dried up a little bit, started to diversify more. And I wasn't shooting to gain the experience. I was more shooting trying to find the clients that would pay a reasonable amount of money for the for the work. Yeah. And currently I'm focusing on local businesses because of where I am in town here, in the small town. Uh, there's a, a lack of good business advertising photography around here, and I've been able to start edging into that market. And it's working out great. So you just need to look at where you are. That may not work for somebody in any other city, but that just happens to be what's working here. But it took a while to figure that out. It took a while to figure out what it would take here. Got it. Got it. Derek, what, what about question. you? Same question. If you're, you know, you're you're looking at it from a diversification standpoint, and you're a new photographer still learning, what what path do you go? Do you focus your your efforts on one thing. I'm I'm really struggling not to use metaphors here. So do you <laughs> focus your efforts? I was gonna say focus the sun's rays on. What, <laughs> do you focus your efforts on one thing, or do you do you you know try many different things? Well, I, I'm gonna stand by my shoot what you love, um, and the reason why I, I'm gonna stick with that is because I think it's hard. You know what happened? You know, I think photography is actually hard to be good. Uh, and you know, in, it, it's it's so deceptive. It seems easy in the beginning. It seems simple, and the cameras do a lot of stuff. But to actually get to the point where you know where you're delivering something that someone else will pay money for, I, I think is it's not easy, and it takes a lot of work, and it's a lot of repetition, and you know, there's just so it's hard uh, to get to that point. And I think th 
that is that if you don't shoot what you love, if you're not doing what you really like, that your odds of getting to that point to where you know you are competent uh, is, I think, the odds go down. So I think that passion is what gets you through the hard stuff, and uh, so you know that's why I, I think that for me anyway, that's the advice I give. Love it, love it. It's fun. I mean, like, yeah. If you if you can pay the bills with this stuff, like both of you guys are doing, and I would I would throw in there as using both of you as in, as examples of diversification. You guys yeah. are success stories, right? I mean, you're diversified. You're paying. You're keeping the lights on, and and presumably eating things other than ramen noodles, using photography, right? So. So, so, Derek, before we move on, just give us a high level. We don't need to get into the weeds of your business, but give right. us a high level of the different buckets that make up the digital story. So, yeah, so I'm, I'm into revenue streams. I think revenue streams is the way to go, uh, multiple revenue streams, and I like to have like four or five going at any, any given moment. So one of them is shoot for hire. Right, and and I, you know, and I like shoot for hire because it also keeps me sharp, you know, and uh, and I meet new people, and you know, you develop contacts. So shoot for hire is definitely a revenue stream, but then I also I like royalty kind of stuff. So the work I do, my photography involved for me doing training videos for Lynda.com, and that's a check that comes every month where I don't actually have to go work for it you know what I mean it yeah. I do something and, and then it, it pays over the long haul yeah. and then I like having one or two big clients and you know I'm very lucky to uh, have you know low pro as a, as a client right now as a big client and you know and that's nice because you can develop a relationship with them and, and have some rapport and then my online properties you know, all the all the stuff I do online and then finally workshops yeah. So, you know, so it's coming in from, and I try to develop one new product every year. I want, every year I want to have one new thing that I'm adding to it. And if it takes off, then I can take off something that maybe isn't doing as well. That's cool. You know, and That's just cool. kind of, you know, try to, try to keep it moving upward. Yeah. That, what you describe, I just, you know, the military, I went back to the military in my head and I started thinking submarines and how, mm -hmm. you know, a submarine if it can take more, it can take a hit, right? Because it's yes. compartmentalized, exactly. and those those compartments represent your revenue stream. So yes. if one of them goes away, the sub is not going to sink to the bottom, right? You no, know, that's okay. absolutely true. It hurts, right? It hurts, and maybe you are going to ramen for a month or two, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't sink. It doesn't sink the ship. No. It doesn't sink. Yeah, Joseph, what's your picture there? What's your your you know from a high level the buckets that make up Joseph Lanashki? Enterprises. <laughs> sure. Well, it's it's very similar to, to Derek's description. I think, Derek, isn't it you, you had the expression of it takes a lot of peanuts to feed an elephant? Isn't that attributed to you? <laughs> <laughs> that I, I've repurposed someone else's uh, saying of that, but it's true. Fair it's, enough. It, I have said it, yes. Yeah, so that's, that's you know, I have the exact same approach. There's the... There's the um, the long tail revenue stuff, the Lynda.com or the other training out there, the writing ebooks and making presets and things that you put up for sale that just continue to sell long after the work is done, and and that's fabulous, right? And that's yeah. that's the kind of living the dream, if you will. Um, but that can also get boring. You know, I, I get a lot of requests, and I'm sure you're the same, Derek. You get a lot of requests from Linda, for example, to do training videos. And you could do them all day long. You could continue to churn out training videos and probably make a, a really good, really good living doing just that. But, you know, I don't want to just do training videos. I yeah. want to shoot yeah. because that's my real passion. You know, that's where I really have a lot of fun. So, yeah, so for me, it's the Aperture Expert, of course, The all the things that are for sale through there, the uh, the Lynda.com training, now that that was acquired by Video to Brains, it's all over there now. And just straight up shooting, straight up photography and education, still do a lot in education. They all are multiple legs of that stool. It's a stool with a lot of legs on it. And I like your approach, Derek, of saying you want to add one new thing a year. Yeah. And if it works, drop something else. That's that's good. That's a, a nice solid approach. I like that. I may have to I may have to steal that from you. Yeah, me too. I may have to steal it too. Steal Joseph, it. That's good. <laughs> Joseph, going from going from corporate the corporate world, Apple, which is, you know, the epitome of corporate um, going from there into doing your own thing, what piece of advice would you give photographers that are sort of looking out the window, daydreaming as they listen to this podcast, and like, you know what, one day I'm going to do the Joseph and, and Derek thing and, you know, have my submarine that's sink-proof. You know, what, would you, what would you tell them? 
Yeah, have have, have, have a big cushion. <laughs> have a big cushion. Yeah. yeah, it's you know it's tough. You, it's when I left. I mean, in some regards, I was very fortunate, and some not so fortunate. I had some very good things lined up when I left, and I left with the impression that this was going to be a lot easier than it was because I had a couple of really big clients right out of the gate that were paying well, and I was like, wow, this you know this whole freelance thing is going to be really easy for me. But then the economy shifted, and I had very large jobs that I had worked for months on bidding and quoting and putting together estimates and planning for that just suddenly got a phone call that said, yeah, we've decided we're going to kill that marketing budget, so sorry. And you're thinking, wow, there's you know, not only all the work that I just wasted, um, it, that was pretty much a quarter of the year's income planned right there that just went away. So, oops, right. Uh, right. you know, those kind of things aren't, aren't happy. So if you have a good job where you're making good money but you want to go freelance, by all means, do it, but just have the cushion. Have but the the other side of that, Joseph, is you know, corporate America. You know, the, the same the same thing that you just saying. Like a client calls you up and says, you know what, we our budgets got cut. We don't need them. We you know we can't afford you anymore. The 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 analogy to that in corporate America would be your entire group getting called into sure. HR and <laughs> saying, or just you know you. what, uh, we're cutting this entire group because we didn't no. make our numbers last month. Sure. You know, sorry, we thanks for your hard work, but there's a box on your desk. Right. Right? So yeah, it's and risky. So, way. Yeah, it can happen to anybody in any place. I mean, it's so it goes the same. Just you, you want to have that cushion. Obviously, you want to have as much savings and, and preparation as you can for that inevitable moment that is probably going to come. Yeah. But if you're jumping ship to start a new business, then odds are much, much higher that you're going to be needing that cushion than if you're in a comfortable job that you've been at for a while and you feel pretty secure at. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, it's it's not to say that you have to. It's if you are if you don't have the cushion and you don't see getting the cushion and you want to do this and you got to make some life changes. You know, move out of the big house, sell one of your cars, start eating more ramen. Uh, <laughs> Frederick's eyes getting all big. <laughs> um, you, you know, you've got to make sacrifices, but and if you've got a family, then the family has to be willing to do that with you. Yeah, that's yeah. that's life. Yeah. Any any final words on your side, Derek, uh, about you know jumping well, out of corporate I, life? I, I I like this part of the conversation, which is having some money in the bank. I, I think it's a good idea. I I like to have three months. One of the one of the changes that you notice when you go from uh, getting a paycheck uh, once a week or twice a month is that. Uh, uh, clients don't always pay with the same regularity so you have to be your own bank uh, a mm -hmm. lot of times and I, I like to borrow from myself while I'm you know trying while I'm waiting for the money to come in from whomever and uh, you know and so having I would say if you can get some money in the bank it, your whole endeavor will, will you'll sleep a lot easier at night and I, I think it's good advice and even if it means staying on the job if you have to for an extra six months to get a little you know money in the bank before you go off on your own I think in the end it's worth it yeah, well, we yeah we've, we've gone pretty far off the Reuters story thing but just to kind of finalize that thought what Derek's talking about having the money in the bank and paying yourself or, or rather borrowing from yourself um, one of the changes that I made to my own business structure I don't know, maybe nine months ago or so, was to start paying myself. Right, so I've got my business account and I have my personal account and savings and all those other things. But I draw a regular paycheck. I don't go through a paycheck agency or anything, but on the 15th of the month, I go in and I transfer a certain amount of money out of my business account into my personal account. And mm -hmm. then I transfer 35% of that over to my savings account because I got to pay taxes when the tax man comes. Right. So I take, I draw a fixed salary. So my personal bank account, if you will, um, is just, just the same way as if I worked at any corporate job. It goes up at a certain point in the month and then it dips down and you know hopefully it's hopefully on average it's getting a little bit higher, a little bit higher and not lower and lower. But then the business account is the one that has you know, for now at least a sufficient balance to continue doing that. Like Derek said, for you know a good three months you should be able to run your business that way and not have to worry about the money coming in. So when that check comes in forty five or sixty days instead of fifteen, it doesn't really matter because the money was already there in the corporate account. Yeah, yeah. I have a client that's net ninety. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's so not once you get past that, that first ninety days, if they if they're if you're invoicing them every month and it's net ninety after the first ninety days, it doesn't matter. It just keeps coming. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So so when you develop your next new product, Frederick, guess who's yes. going to go? <laughs> exactly, <laughs> Mr. Net Ninety. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. See ya. See ya, Net Ninety. So cool. you know, you're, to go back to the original thing, it was this writer story, and one of the talking points you you had said on there was uh, with fewer photographers catching the action at U.S. sporting events, does the image quality suffer? And I was looking for an image. Um, I had to do a little Google searching, but let me let me 
how do I share my screen? Um, and remember, we're screen. audio here too. This audio. We're, we're all right. Okay. Well, this yeah. it, for those that are watching, we'll just do this very quickly. Uh, here we go. Here's here's what happens when you have a lot of photographers on the same game. Okay, describe this photo. <laughs> okay. So you've got a photo, a tight crop photo of at least a dozen, maybe two dozen photographers yeah. with the same long lens pointing at obviously the same thing. And so fewer photographers, is it really going to hurt the image quality of what's out there? I, I really don't think yeah, that's right. a concern. Right. Yeah, that looks like... Uh, all right, I'm going back to the analogy bucket here. That <laughs> looks like koi in a koi pond fighting over a piece of bread. That's <laughs> Pretty much. But they all have, they have those well, are Nikon and Canon lenses. Too. Well, you know, but you know, that's I think it's a good point because uh, that was sobering to me. Like when I first time I got to shoot, let's say, uh, a professional tennis tournament or something like that, and they go, "Your spot is right here," and yeah, and you will, and you will stay in that spot until uh, you know when there's a break in the action, uh, and then you're back in your spot, and you're just going, you know. How am I going to get a shot that differs from everyone? Well, you're going to have a hard time because yeah. you've got to do something else. And, you know, a lot of that's dictated. The Olympics are the same way. Mm. Yeah, when does that get fun? I mean, like, like Joseph, you're talking about being diversified, and you're like, okay, see these two feet, Mark? Mark, put your feet in these yeah. this position. Don't yeah. move. And uh, But be creative and get the yeah. shot. <laughs> get a yeah. shot. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I was... I was at, the Beijing Olympics. Um, That's when I was still at Apple, and I was out there to support the photographers and support that we had a the media center and and a bunch of aperture systems set up out there, and talking to the photographers and you know all of us who are not the photographers, they were going, oh man, that's so awesome. Oh, I'd love to be. Oh, I want to go to the next Olympics. And the photographers are saying, yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, yeah, I don't. I'm, I'm going to watch it from home. <laughs> I'm going to shoot the shoot the TV screen. All right, guys, let's move on uh, to the listener Q&A. Before we do that, I want to, you know, I'm really fond of this week's sponsor. Um, <laughs> I love them so much. And that's MediaBytes.com. It's, the, it's a company that I founded as one of my revenue streams. Look at that, Derek. So yes. let's uh, well, give a listen to this little ad spot that I recorded for MediaBytes. That's it. All right, guys, it's time for some listener Q&A. This is the segment where we answer questions that have been at the top of the TWIP Army's minds. The first one, or the only one that we're going to go into today is from Paul. He says, can someone please demystify the differences between micro four-thirds, APS-C, and full-frame sensors? Why do we have or need three choices? Derek, <laughs> I think you can <laughs> <laughs> what are, is this is like evolution is like why do we have why do we have chimps bonobos and humans you know <laughs> why do we have pickup trucks and you know sports cars um, yeah, yeah. Uh, well just you know in, in technical terms you know as as you work up the ladder micro four thirds is the smallest of the three sensors in terms of dimensions uh, and then APS-C is the next size up uh, mm -hmm. And then full frame, of course, is the size of a 35 millimeter uh, negative, right? Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. full frame, and that's that's where that reference comes from. Mm -hmm. The reason why we have uh, those different sizes is because it allows uh, manufacturers to design different types of cameras. You know, and so instead of just having one size camera that does you know one thing that has this uh, sort of depth of field and you know and responds to low light in this manner uh, they can build smaller cameras bigger cameras uh, cameras that have you know create very soft backgrounds all those things so it's all part of the of the process of creating uh, you know a full toolbox where photographers have these different options and yeah. you know a, a post that uh, we actually did I think on photo help desk today was well should I sell my DSLR if I buy a micro four-thirds yeah now my answer is no I say no I say hang on to it uh, if you're a s enthusiast photographer or a freelance photographer because there are times you're gonna want that DSLR for certain jobs and then there are other times where the smaller mirrorless camera is perfect for uh, what you want to do and and this gives you the option of picking the right tool what if and they don't have that option though what if it's you know they got they got money they've been hearing all this buzz about these mirrorless cameras and they have a they have a DSLR and they're thinking about converting it, but they don't have the money to maintain both. Should they just stick with the DSLR, or should they move the Micro Four Thirds or mirrorless? Uh, that's a, I think that's a hard question, really. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you know, maybe rent 
a mirrorless and get a feel for it or something. But I, I would not get rid of my DSLR, uh, you know, until I was pretty confident that, that I wasn't going to need it. Yeah, and yeah, and so anyway, back to the the listener's question. These different sensor sizes allow manufacturers to create these different types of cameras. You know? Yeah. Okay. So that's that's the different sizes, and we can. I mean, that's a whole different show to talk about. You know what the major differences are between these sure. different types of cameras. But you know, suffice it to say, yeah, the different sensor sizes allow manufacturers to do different things. Right. Yeah, they do. Yeah. They they really. I mean, you know, you could think of them as a uh, you know different size engines in a car. You know, if you want to get mm -hmm. metaphorical. Uh, yeah. So. Cool. If Joseph, you would you, you want to add to that? Yeah, if you want to relate it to film, you know, you look at. At 110 film, that teeny tiny, remember the little cartridges? I remember and if those. If you ever yeah. shot that, the negatives from that didn't give you very good prints past maybe 4x6. And then you had 35mm film, and you could do some pretty nice prints with that. Or if you're shooting medium format or 4x5 or 8x10 film, then you could do much bigger and higher quality prints, and you could have your end result was a much bigger and higher quality image. And that's effectively what this comes down to, not to say that the smaller sensors don't give you quality images, because as Derek and, well, as all of us know, the Micro Four Thirds rocks. I mean, it's a really, really great format, but you put that up next to a 35 millimeter image, a full frame image, or a medium format image, and it, it's it's night and day, right? there. You can't say that Micro Four Thirds is as good as a Phase One. It just isn't. Uh, right. There are differences there, but you it's a difference that you pay for with your wallet, and it's a difference that depends on what you need, what your clients need, if you have clients, or if you're just shooting for yourself, what you're happy with. And, you know, for I think you asked a question about should someone get rid of their SLR, DSLR. As Derek said, it's that's a tough one to say yes to, but if you can get that Micro Four Thirds and shoot with it for a while, and if you never go back to the DSLR, then why keep it around? If you're not right. shooting professionally and you get what you need out of the Micro Four Thirds, then go for it. And I know, Derek, you're doing some pro jobs with the Micro Four Thirds, mm -hmm. and that's awesome. Um, you know, I'd like to take a Zach Arias approach and get go medium format and Micro Four Thirds or smaller, whatever, cameras, and then get rid of the DSLR. But I couldn't do that, get rid of that middle range until I had the top range in there. Yeah, so. yeah, love it. Yeah, speaking of Zach, uh, he and I were trading emails, I think it was today or yesterday, and uh, he will be coming on this week in photo. We're Ooh, I want to be on that show. Awesome. I want to be on that show. Please get me on that He's awesome. Zach's an awesome dude. He is one of my heroes. He's one yeah. of my heroes. And, you know, cool. he's one of the guys that says, you know, do what you have to do to, you know, to make ends meet so you can do your craft. I mean, yeah. you know, he's, he's definitely one of the champions of that. Yeah, he's a true artist. True artist. Cool. All right, guys, let's jump into the Picks of the Week segment. This is uh, this is that part where you can re recommend anything to the TWIP army as long as it is somehow related to photography. Derek, what's your yes, Pick of the Week? Yes, I do. And I'm sorry I didn't write it down, but uh, I have it here. I have a visual Pick of the Week what here. What is it? This, you know, I want to talk about this is a, a ball head X uh, on top of this uh, Joby uh, Gorilla Pod. And the reason why I'm recommending this is that I, it's an excellent ball head. You know, you can pay a lot for ball heads. Ball heads can get very expensive. Yeah. And this one you can get I think for about 90 bucks right now. And the thing about it is that it's Swiss Arca compatible on the plate. Mm -hmm. Which means and you know we're seeing more and more people jump on the Swiss Arca bandwagon for um, you know for uh, plates for even Manfrotto now came out with a Swiss Arca compatible uh, head. So um, it's, a, it's a really great plate. It's a very versatile plate. And this ball head, you know, it, I put it on top of all uh, different tripods. For 80 bucks, it has, a, it has panning control. So you can use it for video also. And mm -hmm. then just has very, very nice, well-machined ball head. 80 bucks, Joby Ball Head X. And right. I just love it. I got like three of them. And... Uh, <laughs> Every time you come on the show, I end up buying stuff. I'm like, literally, I'm not even kidding. After the show, I'm on the couch, you know, doing the, doing the post production, and yeah. I'm on Amazon buying stuff. Yeah, and yeah. I, I should give you my affiliate number when you do you that. Should. You should. <laughs> hey, I'm happy to kick back in. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, these guys understand machining, though. They they really do uh, nice work. Love it. Cool. All right, that's the Ballhead X on the Joby, right? It's called yes. just Ballhead X. Just Ballhead X, and uh, you can either buy it on, uh, you know, on the big. They got the big 
the what they call the Gorillapod Focus here, which is the big Gorillapod. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just use the ball head on all my smaller tripods, you know, the ones that you pack in the suitcase and all that. Yep. And I just have a, a Joby um, a Ultra Plate on the bottom that, with my grip. And so then, you know, no matter what I pick up, it just goes right into the the ball head. You don't have to do all that fiddling around. It's mm. really nice. Really love nice. it. Love it. Yeah, definitely give me the links and all that. And you know, yeah. give me your affiliate link. We'll put that in the notes. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. All right. Thanks for that, Joseph. What is your pick of the week? My pick of the week is. I'm losing it and dropping it. Here we go. It is this itty bitty teeny weedy little Joe uh, Moby card. Yes, Joby, I'm Moby. familiar with that. You yeah. are familiar with that. I know you did an interview with uh, with Ziv a little while ago. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of the iFi products, and this little Moby card is just even easier to set up than the other ones. And I'll be doing more write up on it on Aperture Expert eventually. But uh, I did a little one a little while ago when I first set it up, and this thing is it's a joy to use. It just works. It's really really cool to be able to get the pictures from your from your camera over to your iOS device or your Android device and uh, and shoot them out right away. And now I have a couple of these because I've got this Moby, the, yeah, the Moby one and then the original one. And so they're in, kind of in all of my small cameras. So it's nice I can pick up whatever camera and it's already got that card in it and they're all tethered to the phone and off they go. Yeah. So really cool. Love it. Cool. I, I second that. I think the, the Moby is how I always wanted iFi to work. And, you know, it... It works the way I've always wanted it to, and yep. it's easy. It's really nice. And you wrote the book on this stuff too, right? So I did. I did write the book on this stuff, and it's in so, there. So does it? Does the this Moby's change? Because the Moby wasn't out when you wrote that book, was it? It had. Um, no, it had. It hadn't come out yet. It yeah. hadn't come out yet. So I did regular iFi card and Toshiba Flash Air in the right. book. So how and does then, your recommendation change now that the Moby's out? Is because you were recommending the Flash, the Flash the, Air, the Flash so. Air. Uh, so. Moby's my favorite. Oh, Moby's, cool. Moby's nice. uh, of the cards. Moby's my favorite, definitely. I like it a lot. Excellent, cool, Joseph. You have anything else? Well, I do. I have. Is that a backup? I don't know if I was going to be able to use the Moby. So this is my latest lens from my uh, OMD Micro Four Thirds camera. And for the guy who was asking the question about the differences, this is a forty-five millimeter f one point eight. So it is a ninety millimeter equivalent. Lens. And I it's tiny. It. I mean, look at how it's all tiny. Oh, and it weighs nothing. Love that lens. It's in your pocket. <laughs> this is such a great lens. I sleep lens. with that lens under my pillow. Just yeah. So yeah. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's so small and so lightweight. For those just listening, this thing is what a couple of inches long, and um, it's just it's a great quality lens. Works beautifully in low light, and it's really not that expensive for what it is. And it's mm -hmm. a it's a great piece of gear. So if you're a Micro Four Thirds shooter, I highly recommend this lens. Perfect, and I think I read on on the digital story a while back that that lens you you have the silver one there, Derek. Didn't you write that that, that it's now available in black as well? I they they introduced a number of them in black. I don't remember if they introduced that one that particular one in black. I know uh, you know the one I was waiting for in black they did, which is the seventy five millimeter f one eight. Mm. which is uh, the more expensive big brother to that lens. But Joseph's right, that 45, you can get now, I think, for around 350 if you shop around. That's a steal for mm. that lens. I mean, that, that it's a lens you'll have forever. Yeah. It just makes some creamy, blurry backgrounds. Yeah, really. it's, it's it. sweet. It's sweet lens. I'm a fan. Cool. And Joseph, how much was that lens? Do you... Well, Derek said about three fifty. That sounds sounds about right. Um, yeah. yeah, it's uh, the list price three ninety nine, but I've I've seen some deals and rebates on it. Cool, awesome. All right, that and Moby, uh, the Joby X thing, the ball head X is only sixty four fourteen on Amazon that's right 64? now. That's sixty four. Jeez. <laughs> All metal too. I mean, it's 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 nice. All right, enough, enough. All right, story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, my pick of the week is somehow is somewhat related to yours, Joseph. So, um, and I'm gonna do a little a little review of this thing. This is the this is the Sony NEX 5R that I'm holding up for those of you who are listening. And no, I have not replaced my OMD with this guy, but um, I'm actually dating both of them right now. So I love. <laughs> I love this little camera. I got to tell you, there's so much I need to tell you guys about this. We're going to do, Doug, Kay, and I are actually, we, we launched a new show called All About the Gear. And the next show that we're recording, I'm going to review this yeah. in that show. Um, so I'm not going to give it away. But I'm going to give away one thing as my pick of the week on TWIP that I like about this. And that's the Wi-Fi capability of this thing. It just blows me away. So it's built in, right? So 
Unlike the Mobi, which I have in my OMD because it doesn't have Wi-Fi in there, I put the Mobi in there and I'm I'm set. The the Wi-Fi in this camera is a button on the back. You just it's a soft button on the touch screen and also a physical button. And you just hit it and you it basically creates a little Wi-Fi bubble around itself and then you launch the app on your phone, your Android or your iOS device and all these photos show up in little thumbnails, and you click on the ones that you want and say copy, and it just sucks them in, and it comes in unbelievably fast. I mean, they're just like, and all the images are now in my phone, and I'm, you know, editing shots in whatever photo, you know, Snapseed or whatever that were shot with this APS-C size sensor. So. It's a it's a really kind of sobering experience, you know. So even coming from the Mobi, because it's for me, this was a little faster than the Mobi. It is so faster. Com- yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a lot faster. So, and I don't know why, you know. I don't know if it's because of the OMD or if it's because, you know, it's it, the, the Sony engineers built in hardware inside the camera to make it fast. I don't know, but it's probably it's a bigger faster. antenna and more power behind it. Maybe, yeah. Because I mean, you, you have to fit the antenna into this teeny tiny little chip. Right. Right, yeah, but it it works, and it's just you know if you have one of these five R's or if you're planning on getting one, this this thing was like six hundred bucks, you know. Um, but if you get one, try that feature out because it it just changes things, you know. Because you're now now you're like because this thing is tethered to my, it's connected to my phone, it's connected to my tablet or you know my my iPad, and I can just it's just just so easy. The path it's like the path of, of least resistance to get images in now rather than. You know, well, I'll just copy them out later. You know, well, so. you know, the I think the second half of 2013 into 2014 is going to be the year of finally getting Wi-Fi right by the yeah. camera manufacturers because they all seem to be getting it together. Sony's done a great job with that camera. That's a yeah. good camera all the way around. Uh, yeah. Canon is, is getting it right now, and you know, we're going to see that on the Panasonic. Yeah, Panasonic and and some others that I can't say anything about also have gotten it right too so yeah, yeah. it's yay finally finally yeah. yay I can finally get rid of my camera connection kit for my iPad <laughs> yeah you know it's a, that's a good thing yeah and, and yeah. I like it that they create their own access point so you don't have you know that was another problem when you had to use you know a network that already was around right Yep. Yep. Freddie, so, what, what's the format, uh, the sensor format in that camera? Is it micro uh, thirds? Or? This one is APS-C. It's the same wow. exact sensor that's in the Nikon D7000. Wow. Like the one that's in the D7000 is actually purchased from Sony, so it's it's that, but in this little tiny thing. It's that's insane. impressive. Nice. It is crazy. Yeah. So I'll I have I have another show. pick, Joseph. Since you went twice, I have another pick too. So my <laughs> other pick is this thing, and this is the Moto X from Motorola. It's the first collaborative effort on a phone between Google and the company that they picked up with Pocket Change, Motorola. So, 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 but the cool thing, photography-wise of this, and my pick of the week is not so much the phone, but it's this thing right here. So, say you have, my phone is, this phone is sleeping right now, right? So, say, um, you know, there's this interesting shot that I want to take, and I want to get into my camera. This is how you launch the camera app in this phone. So, I've just flicked it, oh, there it goes. I just flicked it twice in my hand. All I did, to, for you guys that are listening, all I did was was flick my hand twice, uh, my wrist twice, and it launch, launches the phone, or launches the camera in the phone, just like that. So you pull it out of your pocket, you turn it twice, and you're in the camera. So that blew me away. <laughs> that blew me away, aside from the voice recognition and all that stuff in this thing. It's just really cool. And this was the... Uh, this is uh, Derek, I was telling you this before we started the show. Right. This phone is the first Android phone that I've ever, like, literally touched and played with. So... You know, I'm uh, I'm still learning it. I just I've only had it for a couple of days now, but uh, you know, it's it doesn't suck. So <laughs> well, no, well, you know, there, there's something to be said coming in after they've kind of worked out some of the bugs, right? Yeah, <laughs> you know, I and, love it. Yeah, you know, I'm like, think, you know, the Marines have gone in, and this yeah, first the first settlers went yeah. in and took the arrows, and the Marines went in, and now I'm coming in to leisurely set up a government, right? <laughs> yeah. So this is this you know, if you're gonna play with an Android phone, this is a good time to. It is. It is. I'm. Uh, yeah. I'm just having fun geeking out with this thing, sitting down and just like, oh, I can do that. Oh, I can change that. You know, I can change the keyboard. <laughs> oh, wow. Who knew? <laughs> you know? 
So, so, it's, so do, you, do you keep all your devices in separate rooms so they don't find out about one another? Uh, and, and, no, no. I mean, I've, I've trained them to get along with each other. Okay. Yeah, see, in fact, in fact, Miss Android sits right next to Mr. iPhone right here. Oh, so. that's, that's, that's good. Yeah. It's ebony and ivory. They live together yeah. in perfect harmony. <laughs> <laughs> So, Frederick, I have to ask, because you have had an iPhone, obviously, for a very long time. Is it really faster to launch it by doing the flip-flip as opposed to, as you're pulling the iPhone out of your pocket, to just swipe your thumb up and open the camera? No. that's pretty quick. I mean, by the time it's out of my pocket and up, it's, it's open. It's locked. Yeah, yeah. I would say no. It, it, you know, it, or negligible. I don't. I don't think. You know, I wouldn't buy the phone for that for that particular feature. Okay. So no. I mean, yeah, you're right. On my iPhone, I can just flick up on that thing, and I'm in the photo mode to right. take the shot. Um, but it is just kind of cool to have it gesture based. I guess. Sure. So. Okay. Fair enough. Yep. So, those are my two picks of the week. You know, I will. Uh, I will reveal more about this. This particularly, I want to talk about the camera in this Moto X, but we'll do that later. Because there's some. Interesting things about it. I'm not going to say positive or negative, but they're interesting things about the camera in there. Really cool. All right, um, we're at the end of the show, so stay tuned for you know after we get through the the closing credits and all that for a special interview with Mr. Garrett Clark. He's a photographer um, that's outside of the borders of the U.S. He's up in he's in Taiwan in Taipei, Taiwan. He runs he and his partner run a studio called Up Against the Wall Studios. And he and I talk. We had a nice talk specifically about how do you start up a brick and mortar studio in a foreign country, and what are the challenges with that, where the pluses, the minuses, and all that. So, wow. really interesting conversation. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely check that out. All right, guys, we're at the end of Twip. Where can Derek? Where can people go to stay connected with you? Uh, go to thedigitalstory.com. Everything's there, and uh, I'm on Instagram. Uh, despite uh, the the terms of service <laughs> and uh, Twitter and Facebook and all that sort of stuff. So, Love it. Hey, I'm hey, still on Instagram too. I posted today on Instagram. You just gotta, you know, you just gotta. And, and, and to I, I want to come back as in September because September is going to be rocking in our industry. So you know, there's going to be lots. Of you and your teasing, man. Come no, on. No, so just just about about mid September, let's get together again. Jeez, oh, you're killing me with this stuff. All right. Photo Plus. Okay. All right. Joseph Lenaski, <laughs> where can people go to keep up with you? Oh, goodness. Uh, how about I'll just promote the general catch-all. That is joseph.info. You can find all of my projects from there, the photojoseph.com and the Aperture Expert, of course, and everything else will launch from joseph.info. And as you prune projects over the year and add new projects, they'll all show up there, right? That's the idea. Awesome. Cool, guys. All right, and listeners, if you want to keep up with everything in the TWIP universe, you can check us out at thisweekinphoto.com, and remember to join our thriving community over on Google+. And finally, if you're looking for me, you can find me at frederickvan.com or, of course, at mediabytes.com. And with that, it's time to take that lens cap off. <laughs> <laughs>